प्रणाम सु श्री सदगुरु मोस्ट रिवियर्ड एंड रेस्पेक्टेड स्वामी जी हु इज ऑलवेज एन इंस्पिरेशन फॉर ऑल ऑफ अस the chairman of this session professor shikala nayak professor shrinivas acharya and other eminent scholars like my acharya professor shrinivas is sitting here and uh, professor makaran ji is there i take this opportunity to thank uh, and of course my another guru clr sir is here i take this opportunity to uh, thank uh, 25 minutes before i speak note has come <laughs> so it is a threaten <laughs> so it will make you inactive <laughs> i can't perform any action <laughs> anyway uh first of all we are grateful to our revered swami ji for arranging such a wonderful topic uh what uh, i would like to do uh in this uh, 25 minutes uh is to analyze this problem uh from both uh, western and indian perspective Uh, of course western perspective i will be very briefly discussing and with that background i would uh, like to uh, enter into a uh, a debate between the mimamsa kas and dadwaidi why because the philosophy of action this is what the term that is used in western tradition is something which is uh, quite often discussed in the western tradition especially from the time of immanuel kant this has become a very important issue for the westerners but we should note the fact that for all western scholars or they were able to discuss this issue purely from the phenomenal standpoint not from the metaphysical standpoint as we have it in uh, indian philosophical tradition so uh the title i have given uh, for my paper is uh, the linguistification of the sacred the linguistification of the sacred now when we talk about language we always say in indian tradition that language and thought are intimately related for example patanjali says that the expression of thought is a sole purpose that is served by the use of words so to see the problem from indian standpoint one can uh, say that there exists a implicit relation between language and thought but it has been pointed out by many scholars like uh, herald coward who has uh, written a beautiful book on uh, uh, derrida and spota theory uh, who says coward says that indian philosophers have approached the problem from two perspective the phenomenal as well as the metaphysical dimension and also if you come to uh, jj arapura another great thinker from canada of course he's an indian he also says that indian philosophers have carefully avoided the two reductionistic mistakes what are these two reductionistic mistakes one is that reducing language as something as a mode of thought that's all it is a phenomenal trying to understand purely from the phenomenal standpoint this is one way of understanding language and another way of uh, approaching language is to see everything from the metaphysical standpoint and uh, jj arapura says indian philosophers have carefully avoided uh, so jj arapura says we have avoided that indian philosophers have avoided this uh, to reductionistic mistakes and uh, another uh, western scholars i would like to quote is jonas uh, bronkhas 
he has written a very important book on uh, language as reality, wherein he argues that there exists a, a permanent relation between language and reality. This is what we have seen in Patanjali's Yoga Sutra, and the Upanishads also say that. And the Karl Potter very beautifully talks about what is known as the linguistic turn of uh, analytical philosophy in Indian tradition. This is a very beautiful uh, uh, statement which he has made. For example, recently I found out uh, from the Encyclopedia of uh, Indian Philosophies, uh, Volume 4, wherein he says that what the Indian philosophers have discussed is the linguistic turn, because now we are talking about the linguistic turn in the 20th century. But Indian philosophers have discussed this uh, linguistic turn, because uh, their way of understanding language and reality is something entirely different. And with regard to the philosophy of action, which is discussed uh, from the time of Kant, of course, uh, 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 Aristotle also talks about that. But in the, in, the, in the modern period, we can say it starts with uh, Immanuel Kant. And uh, he says uh, that theory of action can be discussed from two standpoints. One of the commentator of uh, Immanuel Kant is uh, Richard Mekate. Uh, he has written a book on Kant's theory of action, wherein he says that in Kant's philosophy, there are two uh, philosophy of theory of action, which uh, uh, Kant is talking about. One is uh, looking at the problem from the empirical or a determinist uh, way of uh, account of action. And the other is non-determinist action, wherein human freedom predominates. So these are two ways of understanding Immanuel Kant, keeping the philosophy of uh, action at the backdrop. And this is uh, what uh, many philosophers have discussed. But what is very interesting is, in the hermeneutical tradition, this problem has been discussed at length. For example, in the hermeneutics of uh, Gadamer as well as uh, Paul Ricoeur, we see that action is considered as a text. Action as a text is something very, very interesting in the hermeneutical tradition. And it should be noted that when we are talking about action, what the hermeneutical tradition says is that action here means social action, wherein we expect the social actors to participate, which means the subjective element of the author or the person who is uh, making some action is not at all important, but the social action is very important. The way in which the social actors play their role is very significant, very important. That has to be given uh, primary importance according to the hermeneutical tradition. So this means action can be seen as a text. This is a very, very beautiful idea because there is always a, uh, different ways of understanding action. Now, when we say philosophy uh, of action as a text, uh, this means the prejudice uh, of the individual is not important. They are sidelined. But when we see action as a text, uh, we try to say when we are reading the text, the, the, the role of the author is not important. So we are trying to transcend that. So similarly, we can see uh, the significance of action by keeping the action in the social context. In, similarly, if you come to the phenomenological tradition, it is uh, Anna Haddon who wrote a very beautiful book on human condition, wherein she talks about the uh, distinction between labor and action. In fact, uh, she says that is what is called a uh, uh, vita activa and vita contemplativa, and she shows the distinction where one can make a clear cut distinction between uh, between between labor and action. So this is what uh, the Western philosophers have discussed with regard to the philosophy of action. But what I'm trying to say is the entire discourse in Western tradition simply focuses uh, on language, but they try to look at language purely from the phenomenal standpoint. That is language as a mode of communication. So the philosophy of action or reading action as a text is a part of it, that's all. Beyond that, they could not go till now. But if you look at Indian philosophical tradition, there is a different way of understanding the term action. This is quite fascinating, especially if you uh, 
uh, uh, look at the dialectics between the Mimamsakas and the Advaitins, it is very clear that uh, action is uh, not mere action, it is a communicative action. This is what, uh, what Habermas talks about, for example, in the Western tradition. Because when Habermas wrote uh, the two volumes on theory of communicative action, it was, uh, it was uh, uh, I mean, praised like anything, because it, of course it's a very beautiful book, wherein he considers uh, that action is not mere action, there is a communication that is involved in action. But once again, I would like to say this is not something new, because in the, in the, in the, in the writings of uh, uh, Searle as well as uh, Austin, we see uh, about this uh, uh, action-oriented sentences. But when Habermas talks about this communicative in the, uh, action, it means that all actions are involved or they, they, they have the center. What is that center? That is communication. So this, when uh, this was popularized in the West, eh, Philosophers throughout the globe were saying this is this communicative action is something uh, very beautiful, very important. But if you closely observe Indian philosophical tradition, especially the dialectic between the Mimamsakas and the Advaitins, one can see the communicative action is not alien to us. It is very much present in Indian philosophical tradition. Of course, I cannot speak about uh, uh, Indian philosophical tradition when two giants are there, my Guruji is here, this side and that side, another Guruji is here, and he's uh, very much uh, well-versed in uh, Advaita and uh, Mimamsakas. In fact, Sar is going to talk about Mimamsakas, but let me try to see from my standpoint. Now, <clears throat> how do we approach this problem? One minute. Huh? Now, when we come to the Mimamsakas, we know the main focus of uh, the Veda, uh, main, main focus of the Mimamsaka is the Vedas. And they argued that all philosophical discussions arise just in connection with uh, some exegetical standpoint. So this means there is always uh, action-oriented sentences which has been emphasized in uh, the Mimamsakas. In fact, uh, different schools use uh, different terms. For example, the word karya is used, karman is used, vyapara is used, bhava is used, and another, another substantive are used. But uh, if you look at the Mimamsakas, it is very much uh, important to see how the, uh, how the sacred text uh, of, uh, uh, the, the, how the sacred text uh, contain uh, action-oriented sentences. For example, take this uh, known statement of uh, the Mimamsakas, the one who is desirous to uh, have, uh, reach a heaven should make a sacrifice. Now, this sentence has got a lot of signification uh, with regard to the community, communicative action which uh, the Westerners talk about, because here uh, there are three important uh, components which uh, have to be taken into account. For example, there is, a, there, is a, there is an object, which is swarga, and there is an instrument by which you can reach a, um, a, um, swarga, that is yoga, sorry, yaga. And third is the procedure by which you can attain that, that is by your individual effort. So this uh, method of understanding the Vedic text is something remarkable. And if you read uh, the... Uh, Mimamsakas, very closely, you would observe that the communicative action which the Westerners talk about is not uh, something new to us. Now, let us see how uh, the Mimamsakas and the Advaitins are uh, discussing about this communicative action. So for me, action here means it is a communicative action. And this communicative action, according to me, is present, is well presented, in fact, uh, in the Mimamsakas. But though the Advaitins have some difficulty in accepting some word. So I'll, I'll just uh, uh, read it quickly. So the Mimamsakas and Advaitins are the two systems which are very close to the Vedic or scriptural authority. And so these two systems are additionally interested in justifying the authority of the Vedas and also in the hermeneutics of uh, Vedic texts. 
So one source of it is uh, the secular statement that is uh, laukika vakyas of uh, trustworthy persons. And another source is uh, the scriptural statement that is vaidika vakyas contained in the Vedas. Now, the, the, the role of secular and scriptural text as source of knowledge, pramana, has been discussed uh, at length, both by the Mimamsakas and uh, the Advaitins. There is a difference of opinion, not only between the Mimamsakas and Advaitins uh, regarding the validity of these texts, but the Mimamsakas themselves are divided on this issue. A verbal statement, be it secular or scriptural, may convey information about an existent entity. Such a statement is called a Siddha Vastu Bodhaka Vakya. The statement fire is hot gives information about fire and existent uh, entity. We have also scriptural statements uh, such as Brahman is real knowledge and infinite, which are existential in as much as they give information about Brahman the existent entity. There are also verbal statements which are injunctive, that is vidivakyas, while the injunctive statement bring the cow is a secular statement, laukika vakya. The injunctive statement, one who desires to reach heaven should perform Jyotishtoma sacrifice is a Vedic statement. Now let us first consider the standpoint of the Mimamsakas on this uh, problem. Though Kumarila accepts the validity of both assertive and uh, injunctive statement, which are secular, in the, in the case of scriptural statement, he restricts the validity to injunctive statements alone. But the Prabhakaras hold the view that only injunctive statements, whether Vedic or not, have validity in keeping the pragmatic attitude he takes of uh, all knowledge. A meaningful statement, according to him, should lead to communicative action. This is what I've been uh, stressing from the standpoint of uh, um, Habermas and others. So a meaningful statement, according to Prabhakara, should lead to communicative action. And when a statement fails to do this, okay, then the purpose of the language is not fulfilled. Further, the Prabhakara maintains that we learn the meanings of the words and sentences through, through communicative action. A very beautiful example is given. Now, for example, in, uh, in, a, in a house, the, uh, the father uh, tells the servant that uh, bring the cow, bring the cow and untie the horse. A child who uh, uh, hears these two statements tries to understand the meaning of the word untie and the word bring. And also the child learns the meaning of the word cow and horse. This is how we uh, practice uh, our language. We teach the language, uh, the function of the language to a child. Now, this is very important because what is uh, what uh, the Mimamsakas would argue here is that whenever we are making a statement, there is a, a, the, the, the verb is very important. The verb, according to them, is the nucleus of the sentence, which means you now when we are reading this uh, two important theories of meaning, Anvita Vidana Vada and Abhitan Vevada, it is argued by the Mimamsakas that verb is the nucleus of the sentence and other parts of the sentence go around this. Why? Because the verb always uh, uh, makes the person to perform some action or other. So it is based on, based on this fact, one can say that all sentences are action oriented. So all sentences are, uh, according to the Mimamsakas, action-oriented sentences only. So communicative action is taking place here. So both uh, uh, for Kumarila as well as Prabhakara, they hold the general thesis that the purport of the entire Veda is action. So according to them, Veda talks about action only because Veda being a book of commandments, consists of injunctions and uh, prohibitions, so that is Vidhi and Nisheda, what Professor Bhatta said in the morning. Then the question is, if so, when it comes to a scripture, not only the Prabhakara, but also Kumarilla restrict the validity of uh, the injunctive statement alone. Then one may ask, ask what about the validity uh, of assertive st statement, Siddha Vastu Bodhaga Vakyas, which are found in the Vedas. Now, the, here I find that there is something very, very interesting, the interesting argument given by the, 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 the uh, Prabhakaras. 
as well as the mimam, I mean, the, the, the Bhattas. Now, the argument is quite interesting for the main reason that the, if the assertive sentences are occurring in Veda, that has to be seen only in the context of the injunction, injunctive sentences, which means assertive sentences contained in the Vedas are significant only when they are construed along with the appropriate injunctive text. So it is interesting to note in this connection that the Mimamsaka, uh, uh, sorry, Mimamsaka is treated both the Arthavadas and Vedanta Vakya alike as a subsidiary. This is very important, subsidiary to the Vidhi Vakyas. It means that the former texts do not have an independent validity of their own, but become valid only when they are construed along uh, with the later texts. So the Vedanta texts, which are assertive in character and which has been deprived of the independent validity by the Mimamsakas. Now, this argument is very beautiful, but look at uh, the Advaitin standpoint. Though the Advaitins are also interested in the theory of communicative action, they are not willing to accept the Mimamsaka standpoint because the theory of community, communi uh, communicative action has to be justified by relying on the injunctive text on one hand and the theory of the centrality of the verb in a sentence on the other. What I, I, I am not elaborating this uh, argument. What the Advaitins are trying to say is, the verb cannot be the nucleus of the sentence. That is, we can't say, I mean, according to Advaitins, we can't say that all sentences are uh, action-oriented sentences. On the other hand, we know, just now we have seen, the Mimamsakas argue that all sentences are action-oriented, and even the other sentences which are assertive in nature has to be construed along with this injuncting so sentences so that their meaning can be known. So this is very clear fr from the standpoint of the Mimamsakas that all sentences are action-oriented. This is fine, the argument. But when you come to the Advaitins, it is very clear the Advaitins do not admit that all sentences are action-oriented sentences. Now, let me give one example uh, uh, from the Advaitin standpoint. The Advaitins reject the claim of the Prabhakaras that even secular statements are valid only if they lead to some kind of action. Now, look at this argument. There are assertive statements like, luckily, this is a statement, luckily, you are happy. Then another statement, a child is born to you, and so on, which do not prompt a person who hears them to an action because these statements give information, that's all. When a child is born to you is only an information that is given to you, according to, according to Advaitins, but this can be questioned, of course. Uh, what is that? Yeah, uh, because these statements give information about an existing something, about some state of affairs. That's all. This is what the Advaitins uh, say. Now, the nature of such statement is such that they do not call for any kind of action on the part of the hearer. But uh, I would say there is some problem, perhaps Sar can clarify that. How can when, when somebody comes and tells a person that a child is born to you, how can a person be silent and say as though nothing has happened? It, it always prompts a person to perform some evil. If, uh, if it is his own child, immediately you will run to see the baby, isn't it? So, but the Advaitins uh, argue, in fact, when this, this beautiful discussion was taught by my teacher, R. Balasubrahman, in fact, I wrote this uh, uh, in a detailed uh, essay in Chattopadhyaya's volume, that a fifth volume, what we call on the same topic, linguistification of the sacred, some 40 pages article, lengthy article, wherein I argued that the standpoint of the Advaitin is right up to this stand, up to this. But after that, let us see how the argument goes. So the nature of these statements is such that they do not call for any kind of action on the part of the hearer. The statement do have communicative competence. This, this is how one can interpret that. One can say that there is communicative competence is very much there, but there is no communicative action which is involved as uh, the Mimamsakas prescribe. 
Now look at the statement, shut the door, bring the book. Uh, these two statements immediately calls for some action. If I am uttering the sentence, uh, shut the door, if my pun or if my servant uh, performs this action, then this means he has understood the meaning of that. If he is silent, then there are two things. One is he, he doesn't want to obey my order or he may not hear my what, what, what I said. So there are, yeah, please conclude. Thank you very much. So uh, what I'm trying to say is, yeah, uh, I'll complete in two minutes. So there is always, uh, uh, there is always a, a scope for action, no doubt, but not uh, in the case of uh, assertive sentences. Assertive sentences can be simply heard and it will not involve a person to ask. Mandana very beautifully says that uh, with regard to this uh, uh, action-oriented sentence, there are two things uh, can be raised. One is uh, upaya, for example, the means, the childbirth, or the end, namely upaya, happiness. So childbirth, which is a means of happiness to the person concerned as already taken place and there is nothing to be done there too. This is a very, very uh, slippery argument, I feel. And another statement is given by uh, Mandana. There is a treasure, there is a treasure beneath this uh, place. A person, Mandana says, a person who has the competence to understand the meaning of the statement may endeavor to dig the place for the purpose of uh, getting hold of the treasure or keep quiet, one may keep quiet also. When somebody utters this statement, I may not be interested because I cannot dig this place. Police will catch me or Swami will kill me. So that is another thing. So after hearing the statement also, one can simply keep quiet. So there is no action that is involved. So this uh, beautiful uh, dialogue between uh, the Prabhakaras uh, uh, and the Mimamsakas very clearly tell us that uh, uh, for the Mimamsaka, this is very clear. All sentences are action-oriented sentences because uh, uh, there is a, a verb is a nucleus, but the Advaitins will not accept this position. And uh, what I am trying to say is the communicative action, which uh, is so much uh, popular in Western tradition, especially after the emergence of uh, Habermas and others, is very much uh, present in Indian tradition. And that too, there is a way of looking at uh, our own tradition from a different standpoint. Now, this uh, approach is uh, avoiding the two reductionistic mistake, as I said in the beginning. So it is very much essential for us to go back to our Indian tradition and see the significance of uh, the so-called uh, communicative action or the uh, relation that is, exists between language and reality. So the term, uh, the topic of uh, my lecture, that is the linguistification of the sacred, the sacred, that is Vedas, which is sacred by nature, contains uh, all injunctive sentences, which uh, convey the significant relation that exists between language and reality. That is the reason why we say it is a linguistification of the sacred. We can make the sacred uh, truth uh, by uh, through language that is language and reality are intimately related and that can be known by using language not as a mode of communication but as a method of understanding the metaphysical reality with this i i thank uh, uh, our revered swamiji and other uh, members of this uh, uh, sri vishnu foundation for uh, uh, for uh, for this wonderful opportunity and also it is, it is uh, my pleasure to present uh, my paper uh, in presence of uh, uh, two uh, my great gurus uh, who are specialized in Indian philosophy. I always uh, uh, afraid to talk about Indian philosophy in presence of scholars, but uh, uh, as my teacher used to say that uh, I came to Indian philosophy very late because he used to charge Daya Krishna also by saying that he has come to Indian philosophy very late, but what, it, it doesn't matter whether you one comes first or one comes last. In a, in a cow uh, that uh, haunts, you know, they grow later. Ears and other parts of the body are born with the, uh, with the cow, but horns are uh, you know, growing after some time only, but the horns are very strong. Thank you very much.